I'm going to remain anonymous for this, but just wanted to say that I've had my hand in working for several large, reputable, well-known politicians and other government bodies. I'm here to tell you that they all know about this stuff and what's really going on. I'm not saying all of them are exactly in on it, but I'm saying that there is a lot of inside baseball and political maneuvering. That's why we have all these different factions, to keep people confused so the truth will never come out. Or if it does, you're only getting fractions mixed with misinformation. Let me just give you some examples. There is a notable person who was a chairman of a recent person's campaign, and yes, I am purposely being vague. She is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, which has been around for many years now. And as you know, they're all about globalization. They want to merge us into one ruling world government with no borders so that corporations can roam free across the globe with no regulation or oversight from any elected officials. Now, I'm not sure how much time you have, but I wanted to tell you what I know because this thing scares me badly. When I worked in D.C., we had a lot of people come through my office who were whistleblowers, uh, military personnel, law enforcement, and some very high-level government officials. People who, what I call, work on the back end. You know, you never see their faces, hear their name, but they're the ones pulling a lot of the strings of the public puppets you see now. They all had the same story to tell. I don't know how up to speed you are on what's going on, but essentially, there is a group of people who are very powerful, and they have been doing this for a long time. But I never heard them called the Cabal until you started talking more about it. Even some of my friends in law enforcement can't really talk too much about it and what they know. But some of these things need to be said. In fact, a friend of mine who works in the FBI had been told not to investigate specific pedophile rings because it was off-limits. And if they did, they would face losing their job, prosecution, or worse. This stuff goes way back into history where kings would surround themselves with young boys. Also, the reptilian thing, that's also this whole other thing to unpack that would need its own email. Actually, probably a book. But what I can tell you is there are many different types of aliens. The reptilian stuff is real, and they've been here for a long time. I also have a close friend who's an attorney in Texas who's worked with some very big names in the political spectrum. I know what I'm talking about when it comes to these people, their history and their actions. This particular political couple was a part of a group that were running guns from Libya through Turkey into Syria. This was back in 2011, right before these large Arab protests. Word was kept hush-hush because if word got out that Americans were involved, then this couple could have faced massive charges of treason, so on, so on. So, they had their lawyers come up with this idea where they would send American arms dealers as consultants under contract to the Libyan government. But they were really working for the CIA. And then these consultants would hire other people to send guns into Syria. The thing is, if this couple knew that if anyone found out about this, then they could be in a lot of trouble. So they came up with another plan where they'd hired some foreign companies owned by Americans who didn't care about risking anything. They just sent American arms over there and got paid for it. I also have other friends who work in D.C. specifically as an attorney, and they can even begin to unravel all the cover-ups that are happening. It's very, very real. One time, I was also at a meeting at the White House when Obama walked out from behind his desk after we finished talking about something else entirely unrelated to UFOs or aliens or any of that stuff. And I thought this was interesting that he brought this up completely unannounced. He said, You know, one day we're going to have to tell the people about the UFO incidents. Then he laughed like it was some kind of joke, but nobody else did because everybody knew he wasn't kidding around. I was also surrounded by about six other people when we were having this discussion. Another friend of mine used to work as an aide for Senator John McCain back during his presidential campaign in 2008, so this friend of mine saw him nearly every day through his college years. He once told me that while sitting in his office, 
he had seen a UFO once while flying over the Phoenix area, and that it was all real. That, supposedly, McCain had access to deeply classified documents, where it goes in depth on what these beings were, what they looked like, how they communicated, the technology they used, etc., he would also go into detail about enormous triangle lights and the perimeter of each side, and it just goes really in-depth from there. Of course, from my understanding, none of this stuff was ever documented, at least nothing the public will ever see. Anyway, I know at this point this email is kind of turning into a jarbled mess, so I'm just going to go ahead and end it for now, but I have many more to send you on a lot more information that I think you would find very interesting. Stay safe. This happened to me right before I turned 13. I was sleeping in the top bunk bed, and my little brother was on the bottom. I remember seeing a shadow of a man or something walk by our door, which is at the end of the hall. I was so scared, I did not want to get down from the top bunk, even though it was only six feet from the ground. It still felt like a long way down. My brother said he did not see anything, and he wanted to come down and sleep with him on the bottom bunk, which I did. I knew he was lying. He had seen it. I'm not sure how long it was before we fell asleep, but when I woke up in the morning, my brother was practically sleeping on top of me. I remember being so tired and stiff that it hurt to move. I didn't feel right after that first night, and things would keep happening. I would hear footsteps in the house. My door would open on its own. I was so scared that every night when we went to sleep, I would ask my brother to sleep on the bottom bunk with me. I didn't want to be alone in that room. I never slept well after that night. My parents would claim they would hear strange noises too, but we just thought it was our cat or something. Then one day, when my mom was cleaning out a closet, she found an old photo album of pictures from when my dad's family lived there before us. She told us about the picture of a man standing at the end of the hall. I was scared. I did not want to look at it. But my brother did, and he said it looked like a picture of a man who had lived there before us. It freaked me out even more after that. We never talked about it again. Years later... As we both grew up, I don't exactly remember how my brother found out, but apparently the family that lived in there before us dealt with a tragedy. The man we saw in the pictures had killed himself in the same room that my brother's room and I was. Apparently it was his office, and he blew his brains out. If I'm remembering correctly, my brother was able to contact the family or something I don't exactly remember. I never looked into it that far because I didn't really care. Unfortunately, I lost my brother early last year in 2022, so I can't ask him about it. In a way, this experience, although terrifying when I was younger, comforts me now in a dark way. I know the afterlife is real, and the possibility of seeing my brother again is real too. I live in the U.S., but grew up on a farm in rural Canada. I've spent my entire life in the country and have had many unusual experiences. This story is about a horrific encounter that happened in 2005 when I was just 30. I had moved to an apartment building near downtown Calgary, Alberta. It was just me living there at the time. My wife and kids were staying with her parents for a while, as we sorted out some marital and financial issues. My work schedule allowed me plenty of free time during the day, so I would often take walks around town or go to one of the local parks after work, just to clear my head. I felt like staying in my place was just, it was bad news. One such park was Prince Islands Park, located right near around where I was. The island had been connected there for quite some time, but even today... It feels like its own little oasis amidst all the concrete surrounding it. Anyway, one afternoon, I was walking around when I came upon a group of people playing frisbee. One of them said hi to me and we started chatting about what they were doing there on the island that day. 
They told me it was their regular get-together spot. We talked for a little while longer, then parted ways. They went back to their game while I continued my walk around. After a few minutes, I decided to take another stroll along the Bow River path on the north side. As I walked down the trail, I noticed something strange ahead. There was a large tree directly across from where I stood with its branches hanging over in the river below. The branches appeared to be moving slightly, but not enough for any wind or other natural phenomenon to cause it, almost like someone was gently pushing them aside every so often, as if trying to look out at something in the river below. It didn't make any sense, because why would anyone want to spy on water? And who would hang out by a tree just randomly peering through its branches at water? This seemed odd enough, but... Things got even more strange after this. I heard singing. A woman's voice coming from behind me. My first thought was that some homeless lady had followed me onto this part of the trail because she wanted money or food or something else. But then again, how could she have possibly known which way I'd go next since I hadn't been looking back at her? Also, why would she wait until now before following me instead of immediately getting in front of me as soon as she saw which direction I headed off in? Something wasn't adding up here, but whatever. I continued pressing on forward towards the shaking branch when I see this black blur, I would call it, come down from the tree and shoot right past me. It was the strangest thing I'd ever seen. It was like some hallucination or something. Instantly afterwards, I felt this cold brush of wind fill up all around me. It was like I was enveloped in winter, and then I would hear this faint singing from all around me. It was coming omnidirectionally, up, down, left, right, it didn't matter. I was surrounded by it. I felt lightheaded and dizzy, like I was about to fall over. I remember it feels like I blacked out at one point, because I could recall time lapses in my memory where I was walking on the path. I heard what I thought was a homeless lady singing behind me. The black blur came rushing at me, and then... I remember sitting down on the ground next to the water, just kind of collecting myself and not really sure what had happened. I'd maybe sat there for about another hour or so until I decided it was time to head back. I felt weird the entire time, like I had problems remembering things. It was a very, very strange experience. I'm sorry this wasn't more spooky or maybe up the lines of what you were looking for, but this is a genuine experience that I've had that could or couldn't be with the paranormal, I'm not sure. Maybe you can make sense of it. I've been into the outdoors since I was about 10 years old, and have been camping and hiking for many years now. My family is from the north woods of Wisconsin, but we moved to Texas when I was around 12. We spent most summers up in northern Wisconsin, where my dad grew up and still has some land that he owns there with his brother and sister-in-law. We would go up there for a week or two at a time, stay in the family cabins that my father built when he was younger. I have spent many nights alone in those cabins, sometimes with my brother, sometimes by myself. They're about 20 miles from the nearest town, and you have to take a dirt road for about 10 miles before getting to the family land. Listen, my brother is 6'4", I'm 5'10", so we both felt pretty safe up there, even at night when it was pitch black outside. There's no cell service up there either, which made us feel more isolated than normal. There are also some big game animals in that area, but we never had any issues. We would also go hunting up there as well, but I'll get to that in a later story. So, anyway, this happened about five years ago. My brother and I had been up there for about a week, but we were leaving the next day to go back home to Texas. It was around 9 p.m., pitch black outside, no moon. We were in one of the two cabins playing video games, having some beers before going to bed. The cabin has two doors on it, one leading into a bedroom area, which is separated by another room by a half wall and the other door leading into a living room slash kitchen area. The cabin also has two windows, one in each of those rooms. We were playing video games when 
we heard something outside the front window of the cabin, which was only about 10 feet away from us. It sounded like somebody was banging on that window with their fists, but it wasn't rhythmic, like somebody would do if they were knocking on a door. It was more like someone was hitting a window randomly, but it was loud. My brother and I looked at each other with our eyes wide open, not knowing what to think or do next. We both got up from the couch, walked over to that front window, trying to see who or what was outside in the darkness of night. We couldn't see anything because there wasn't any light shining out from inside of that cabin. After about 30 seconds or so, we heard something hit the same window again, this time sounding louder than before. My brother yelled, Who's there? As he started banging on one of those windows with his fist, just like whoever or whatever it was outside had been doing. At first, nothing happened for about ten seconds. Then we heard some movement coming toward us through the brush behind our cabin, which is where my dad has an old trailer parked back there, along with a couple of ATVs and tool sheds. We could hear something or someone walking through the brush, but we couldn't see anything because it was pitch black out. My brother and I were both pretty scared at this point, not knowing what to do next. All of a sudden, we heard some movement on the roof above us as well, like something was running around up there or jumping from one side to another. We looked at each other again with our eyes wide open in fear, wondering who or what that could be up there. The only thing that came to mind for me was maybe my dad's dog had snuck into one of those cabins while we weren't paying attention and somehow got on the roof. After about five minutes of hearing whatever it was run around on the top of our cabin, jumping back and forth, my brother finally yelled, Get off our property! He then grabbed his shotgun, which is always loaded with buckshot shells. He opened up the doors leading out of the cabin. But again, we couldn't see anything. We could still hear whatever it was running around on the roof. So, he aimed his shotgun and prepared to fire. He emptied one of those three rounds into the air, then stopped for a minute to listen for any movement or sounds coming in that direction. All we heard were some coyotes yipping in the distance, which is common at night. My brother told me to grab my flashlight and follow him as he walked towards our dad's trailer, which was only a little bit away from the cabin. When we got over there, I noticed something sitting down against one of those tires, a huge pile of deer guts. It looked like someone had torn open an entire deer carcass and just dumped all of its insides onto that tire. The smell coming off of it was absolutely putrid, like rotten meat mixed with feces. There were also pieces missing from this deer carcass as well, like someone or something had been eating parts off it while they sat here next to this trailer. We both stood there looking at each other in shock, wondering what happened, who did this. As soon as I said, what do you think happened? My brother yelled, Wendigo. Wendigo is basically a cannibalistic creature living amongst humans during winter months when food sources are scarce up north, where my family has land, and where I've spent many nights alone camping and hiking before, too. This encounter scared us pretty bad. Neither of one of us wanted to stay up north anymore, after experiencing like something like this late at night, all by ourselves, without cell service or anybody else around. Thankfully... None of us ever saw what exactly made all these noises, nor did we ever see whatever tore apart that dead deer. It was a warm summer night when I had my first encounter with the unknown. I was driving through a remote desert area here in New Mexico, making my way to a nearby observatory to do some stargazing. But as I drove down the winding dirt road, I saw something that I could not explain. A bright light that seemed to be following me and almost hovering in the sky above me. I thought it might be a shooting star or 
possibly a satellite, but as the light grew in intensity, something was obviously wrong. I pulled over to the side of the road to try to get a better look at what was going on. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before, this sleek silver craft that seemed to almost pulsate with energy. It was as if the craft was alive. I was frozen in awe and fear, unsure of what to do. And then with a suddenness that took me by surprise, I was pulled up into this great wall of light, as I guess you could call it, enveloping me. And that's the last thing I remember before everything went dark. When I woke up, I was in a white room. Everything was white and very bright. I was surrounded by beings that I can only describe as different. They were unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Tall, slender, white pale skin, but it almost appeared as if their flesh itself was made out of this bizarre metallic material. They spoke to me, not in any language I could understand. It was telepathic. They were communicating in a way where I didn't exactly understand what they were saying, but at the same time, I understood what they were conveying to me, if that makes sense. It's as if their own thoughts were invading my mind with a force that left me feeling dizzy and disoriented. It was then they informed me for the reason they took me. They told me I was a part of a special bloodline that they had been monitoring for generations, that apparently I had been chosen to receive a message. The message was simple and horrifying. The end of what we know as the world was coming very soon, and there is nothing that I or anyone could do to stop it. Over what felt like hours, they showed me visions of the apocalypse, tsunamis, cities collapsing, fault lines collapsing, whole states and countries submerging in the ocean from drastic earthquakes, the sky turning blood red. It was like something out of a nightmare, very reminiscent of the movie 2012, actually, but far more realistic. I felt a sense of hopelessness and despair that I had never experienced before. It was like an actual movie, except I was living in it. It was around me. I was in it. But I understood in that moment that they were showing me the future. When the experience was over, I kind of just remember waking up back here, next to my car, alone in the desert, with really no memory of how I got there, but I do remember what had happened up there. I felt the physical effects of what had happened. I felt nausea. And apparently, after going to the hospital, I had some pretty severe symptoms of high radioactivity, including dizziness, nausea, a strange metallic taste in my mouth. But I couldn't explain to the doctors what had happened. And every now and again, I'll get this strange metallic buzzing or ringing in my ear that I've never had in my life. And it's almost pulsating and it gets so loud and it hurts and then it suddenly dies. I'm not exactly sure how to explain it. Like I said, when I drove myself to the hospital, they kept asking me what did I do and why do I have these symptoms. I couldn't tell them my experience because I'm sure I would have been put up in the nut house. This was years ago, by the way, and I am still dealing with the aftermath of all of this. I have become literally obsessed with finding answers, so I've been scouring the internet for any information on UFO sightings or extraterrestrial encounters, just trying to make sense of what happened to me. I even reached out to Phantoms and Monsters, I've reached out to Reddit, and so far I've not really got a reply back. But the more I search, the more I read up and realize that I might never find the truth and that the times the truth might have peaked itself into the horizon of the internet, they were squashed, they were taken down, and blacklisted. I do not feel the same now when I look up at the night sky, and I could still sometimes see that hovering, glowing light. It does serve as a constant reminder of the unknown reality that sits there. I don't know if I was dealing with interdimensional beings, or really what it was, or why I witnessed the end of the world. And if those visions are correct, then humanity should be terrified. And if it's not, 
that I'm not exactly sure what they are trying to achieve, and I don't know what's so special about my bloodline. I'm just a regular, ordinary person. I am aware that this world is full of things we cannot possibly understand. In some ways, it has made me more aware of the fragility of life, the fact that we're all just small players in a larger cosmic drama. It's made me appreciate the moments we have here on Earth and to cherish the people and the experiences that make life worth living. But in other ways, it's left me with a sense of unease and uncertainty, a feeling that the world is not as it seems. I'll never be able to fully explain what happened to me on that warm night, or even make sense of the horrific visions that were shown to me. But it's a part of me now, a part of my story that will stay with me for the rest of my life. For starters, I'm 24 years old, female, and I've lived all around the U.S. for the past seven or so years. My parents split when I was really little, so I've mainly just been moving around with my dad. Well, he passed away back when I was 20 years old, so it's pretty much just been me on my own. And one thing that's really helped me deal with the loss of him and my mother is spending time out in the woods and enjoying nature, solo camping, solo hiking. While a lot of my peers my age are busy in college, dealing with stressful relationships, jobs they hate, I'm what you would call a vagabond. Not exactly homeless, although I do couch surf quite a bit from time to time. Fortunately, I have very good friends whom I call and refer to as my family. But... That's not why I'm writing this. Just this last summer, in 2022, I was spending quite a bit of my time out in the Appalachian Mountains, doing some soul-searching, trying to find myself, and centering my soul within nature itself. And while all that is good and dandy, it's what happened while I was out in the middle of nowhere that has still left me unable to venture off too far. At least for now. The TLDR of the whole thing is I stumbled upon a den of some kind, and I believe for a short time I was being hunted, or at least driven out of the area by whatever it is lived in that den. If I had to guess, I'd say I was roughly eight to ten miles off any near trail, which is pretty far out in the woods for most hikers and adventurers. I had set up camp near a small stream, so I had plenty of water, I had plenty of snacks, and I was even setting up my own traps, and I was doing just fine. Well, on one of the days, I got the hare to decide to go and explore a little further. I'd say no more than half a mile to three quarters of a mile away from my camp was this sort of valley, I guess you can call it. While hiking in, I saw quite a few large bucks bedding down in this area, several does as well. I figured this would be a great area to find any deer sheddings I could get a hold of, since I love collecting them. This is probably where I should have picked up on my instinct that something was wrong. Upon only coming in here a few days ago, there were a lot of deer. Now, it was completely empty, desolate of almost any animal life or so that I sensed and saw. However, in that moment, I didn't think it was really too strange considering most animals do migrate through certain areas to follow food and whatnot, so, so I just went on my merry way looking for any sheddings I could find. Now, as I'm doing this, searching in this small valley, I began to get this strange sensation over me. It was like my gut instinct was screaming at me to get out of the area, to leave, that I was in danger. But looking around, I didn't see anything. I didn't sense that I was being followed or stalked by a cougar or a bear. So I just ignored it and kept searching. Now, as I went further down into the valley, there's a part that almost, it's not exactly a cliff, but it kind of dips down a little bit. And this is where I found a rather large opening into what I can only assume was a den based upon what I found. Now, the hole in the ground, or I should say this 90-degree hole, was roughly about 6 by 6. Not a perfect circle, but 
almost very close to it. Something had clearly burrowed this hole, and when I say it was about six feet high by about six feet wide, I don't know of any animal, not even a bear, that creates an opening this large. I was curious, and against my better judgment, actually was able to fully, without crouching or getting down, walk into this large den. Now, this wasn't a cave like many bears will do. This was actually dug out completely under the ground. You could even see tree roots hanging in one of the corners. If I had to give an actual estimation of how big this chamber was, I'd say probably maybe 15 or 20 feet in length and maybe no more than 6 to 7 feet in height. The entire den reeked like blood, urine, and wet dog. As I shone my light around, closer to the corner of the den, I saw what appeared to be several large deer carcasses that looked to be almost completely intact, or at least the skeletal frame, but you could tell it had been eaten on, and there were also other miscellaneous skulls. It looked like just a bunch of deer skulls, honestly. And as soon as I kind of crawled down into this den probably really going no more than a few feet in, just to make an observation, I just got this feeling that I should not be in here and I need to get out now. So instead of exploring further, which I would have loved to do, I just decided to crawl out, crawl up the little incline, and try to move my way out of the valley. Now as I'm doing this, as I'm exiting this den, immediately I noticed that the forest was even more quiet than it was before. I mean, I've been in the woods many times. I've spent hours upon hours on trails and going through the woods, and I've never experienced the woods so quiet before. It was as if all sound around me had completely stopped. I could have sneezed, and you would have heard it for miles. The sensation down inside my body wasn't that of being watched or followed or stalked, It was more just a burning sensation, as if my entire being was screaming at me to get to safety now because things were about to get bad. Now, this time, I did listen to my instinct, and I assumed that the den I had found or whatever was bedding down in there was probably a large bear or maybe a den of cougars or something. I mean, clearly something had been dragging fairly large kills down in there. I mean, the complete skeletons I saw were pretty large bucks, so something was pulling something down in there. I'm not too educated on how cougars or bears drag their kills or what they do with them, but it just wasn't sitting right with me. So as I'm climbing my way out of the valley to get to part of the ridge line, I begin to hear sounds in the woods around me as if something really big is moving in my direction. Now, I can't really tell four legs, two legs, none of that, like you tell a lot in your stories, but I could tell that whatever it was was very large by the size and weight and how it was stepping on the ground, and it was breaking brush and moving quickly in my direction. Without hesitating, I upped my speed by like two or three, moving quickly back to camp. In hindsight, this was probably a terrible idea because I believe that I led this animal or these animals to my campsite. Now, it took me probably about 30 minutes or so to get back to where I was camping just because I took the long way around, which didn't have as much dense foliage as the way I took in. And it sounded like whatever was following me was not following me with the intent of hunting me but following me with the intent of keeping hidden just enough far back so that way I wouldn't see anything, but yet that it could keep tabs on me. Now, I'm not a biologist or a wildlife expert, but I almost am certain that cougars and bears, which both hunt, don't do that level of hunting. Again, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I could very well be wrong, but I've never had that feeling in my gut before. As a matter of fact, I've ran into a very large black bear, a mama black bear, with two cubs, and even that encounter wasn't as terrifying. I've been stalked by a very large cougar back when I was in Arizona at one point. That's another story for another time. And again, I didn't really remember the same behavior, at least not as menacing feeling. 
But once I made it back to camp, I tried to calm myself down and just spend the rest of the day hanging out by the stream. Fortunately, at some point, it seemed like the sounds of the forest kind of came back alive and the unsettling feeling seemed to die down after a while. I decided it was best to not really venture back to that valley again after that. Now fast forward to that night, and it seemed like the forest would come alive with these strange howling, growling sounds. I can't really go into detail about what it sounded like because it was unlike anything I've ever heard. It definitely left me unsettled, and I could have sworn that there were times in the night where I heard large animals approaching my campsite, or at least just by the tree line. But I can't say for sure. I also have no proof because there was a lot of moss on that area of the ground where I was hearing these noises, and so there's really no way to tell. You can imagine my sleep that night was very little. And so the following morning, I figured that it was probably best that I move to another area west of where I was. And as I'm getting up my things, which is just a one-man tent and some cooking supplies, I noticed there were these really large three-toed tracks right around my campsite. In fact, the closest one I'd probably say was no more than 15 feet, but no closer than roughly 9 or 10 feet away from my tent. Now, I only saw the one print, and then I saw a few smaller ones away closer on the other side of the trees or right by it where it turns to dirt near the creek. Now, I have no idea if this print that I saw had anything at all to do with what I had heard or encountered the day before, or if I was dealing with something, but as I looked at the print, it was pretty large, I mean, far larger than my hand, but did not appear to be from a bear or a cat or anything that I'm familiar with, and the indentation was at least half an inch to an inch deep in the mud. Kind of startling, to say the least. All I knew is that I would probably be wise to pack up my stuff and move really quickly west. So that's exactly what I did. And I hiked for probably about four to five more miles until the afternoon when I had felt securely safe from that previous camping spot. Now I was kind of up on this small bluff overlooking the forest below. Just like the day before, I decided to take the rest of the afternoon and evening off just relaxing, filling my canteen, getting water, and just trying to, I don't want to say recover, but calm myself and calm my nerves down from the previous day's adventures. Now, once night hit, the forest erupted with all sorts of noises, specifically that same growling and roaring sound that I had heard the previous night. Only this time, it sounded closer like it was within a few hundred yards, where the previous night, it sounded like it was much further away, and there were multiple of these. Now, I know I'm using the words roar and growl here, and I wish I could attribute these noises to some known animal like a bear or a wolf, but truth be told, I can't exactly place what noises these were, because I've never heard a noise like this. In fact, I can't even think of you to jump on YouTube and look for a specific noise because it doesn't match anything I even know. What I can tell you is that when I heard these noises, it definitely soured my stomach. It felt like whatever den I had stumbled upon the other day, that it was these. These animals, these large predators were bedding down and eating and living in that den. And these noises went on till probably 1, 2, maybe 3 in the morning. It was nearly almost all night long. At this time, I actually didn't have a phone with me at all, just a watch and a GPS. So that's kind of how I made my way around and got to and from trails. And I surprisingly only got a little bit of sleep that night, if any at all. So the following morning, I got up bright and early, and I decided it was safe to make my way to the nearest trail and try to hitch a ride to one of my friend's places. Now, I will say this, and this, I thought, was probably the strangest thing out of everything I've told you about. The next morning, it only took me probably about three hours to make it to one of the nearby trails, and I followed it all the way down to one of the parking areas, 
And this is where I was fortunate enough, or unfortunate, I guess, depending on how you look at it, to speak to a ranger who was working in and around the area. And she was very sweet to me, very kind. She had asked what I was doing, where I was going, if I'm okay, did I need anything? And her and I were just chatting, and I was kind of telling her my life story, which she thought was very interesting. And then I started telling her the same story I just wrote you. And immediately, as I'm telling her about the den and the sounds and stuff I heard, I could see her face go from interested to almost pain. And not pain in an emotional or physical sense, but pain as if she was almost wincing like she knew something she couldn't quite say, but I could see that she really wanted to say something. And I could visibly see her holding back her tongue, at least she wore that expression on her face, and she began to tell me, almost in the slyest way possible, that that area where I was just at is not really advised that I go solo hiking down in and that it can be extremely dangerous. In fact, in the past six months alone, they had three hikers go missing while also solo hiking in that same area. They were never found. Now, the feeling I got, you know how when you have conversations with people, you can kind of just read their body language, their emotions? Well, the gist I got from it is that she was definitely holding back information that I think she knew, and she tried to water it down by telling me that it's probably not safe. Now, I didn't go into detail about the footprint that I saw, uh, the prints by the tree, or the level of growling and sounds that I had heard, just pretty much a quick, digestible version of what I already told you. Either way, it was more her reaction and all the things she did not tell me is what really left me unsettled. Now, after we had our discussion, we parted ways, we said our goodbyes, I was able to successfully borrow someone's phone, called a friend, hitched a ride, went and spent time at their place, and I figured I would use that time to try and research if at all anything, what I experienced. I've told my friend that same story, and she thought it was pretty unsettling. She even helped me do some research, and kind of looking around on Reddit and Google, I came across a few things that seemed to point to more towards fictional things, you know, like the supernatural or... Uh, I guess what some people are calling a dog man. Now, before I go further, I just want to say that I am not a monster in the woods kind of girl. I never have been into that. I've always thought that was completely ridiculous and not even believable with an ounce of truth. And I can't say for certain that the things I experienced really necessarily match up to what people were claiming that I saw. It definitely feels like it was out of the ordinary. And it wasn't something that I or others would consider normal. You know, hey, perhaps it really was a bear. Perhaps it was a cougar or maybe a pack of large wolves. I don't know. But all I can say is it definitely was different than any other time I've been out in the woods. It disturbed me and it left me unsettled so much so that it actually stopped me venturing out in the woods for a while. And as even now in 2023... I still am a little apprehensive to go too far off the trail just in case my life might be in danger like it could have been that day. It was the summer of 2016 and my friends Michael and Jacob and I decided to go camping in the George Washington National Forest in Virginia. We heard about a great camping spot from a good friend of mine though he mentioned that the area might be restricted since it's pretty far off trail. However, we did see several fire pits around and figured it would be fine to camp there, at least for the night. We arrived at the spot in the late afternoon, setting up our tents. Afterward, we quickly gathered up some kindling and wood to start a fire. As the sun began to set, we sat around the fire. We had a couple beers and just began reminiscing about the good times of the past and our current lives. We also discussed work, relationship, and shared some jokes. 10 p.m. came pretty quick. We noticed that the woods had now become eerily quiet. 
The usual sounds of crickets and other nocturnal critters had all but vanished. We also felt a strange sensation, like static electricity in the air. The hair on our arms stood up, and we could even hear a faint humming noise. Suddenly, there was a deep bass noise, and a bright light flashed in the distance. It lit up the entire forest like a powerful firework, but it lasted for about a minute. The light then split into three or four smaller lights that shot down into the trees. We stared at each other in disbelief, unsure of what had just happened. We considered several possibilities. Maybe it was a meteorite, some strange weather phenomenon, or even something man-made. Eventually, we decided to shrug it off as unexplainable and went back to our conversation. Well, around 2 a.m. rolls around. We called it a night and crawled into our tents. Michael and I shared one tent while Jacob opted to sleep by the fire. 3 a.m. rolls around, and we're suddenly awakened by Jacob shaking our tent violently. He sounded panicked as he told us there was something big watching our campsite from about 50 feet away near the woodline. We climbed out of the tent and squinted through the darkness toward where Jacob was pointing. At first, we didn't see anything. But our eyes soon adjusted to the dim moonlight filtering through the trees. We all noticed an unusually large silhouette. It appeared to be standing on two legs, swaying side to side as if trying to get a better view of us. Our minds raced with fear as we thought about bears or even other dangerous wildlife known to inhabit Virginia's forests. As we continued to stare at this figure, another loud scream echoed throughout the forest, similar to what you might imagine a pig being slaughtered would sound like, but much deeper and more resonant than any animal noise any of us has ever heard. This cry made our ears ring and made us cower. Within seconds, this unsettling noise subsided. We heard the sound of rapid footsteps approaching. Three or four more, similar to the first one, emerging from the darkness and began circling our camp. We were frozen, completely unsure of what to do. These things seemed curious about us, but also acted aggressive. They would dart towards our tent, only to run back a moment later, as if bluff charging. We continued to watch them warily. Another loud scream rang out, and one of the creatures grabbed a tent pole and pulled on it with such force that it dragged the entire tent several feet across the ground. At this point, Michael, Jacob, and I were yelling at each other over what we should do next. It was clear that staying at our campsite any longer was no longer an option. We needed to get away from this as quickly as possible. Gathering whatever courage we had left, we made a mad dash for our truck, which was parked a ways away. Once we made it, we fumbled with our keys and trembling hands before finally starting the engine and slamming down on the gas pedal. As we sped away from our campsite, one of those monstrous beings appeared directly in front of us on the road, illuminated by our car's headlights. We got a better look at it now. Standing around eight feet tall, with dark gray fur, covering the majority of its body, except for its chest, which was a white or yellowish color. Its face reminded me of a hyena, but somehow morbid and twisted. Knowing full well that hitting this thing might damage our vehicle beyond repair, or even worse, provoke their aggression further. 
we swerved around it, just narrowly avoiding a collision while praying that none would follow us down off this mountainous trail. Eventually, arriving safely back onto paved roads leading towards civilization, exhaustion took over all three inside, causing me, who sat behind the driver's seat throughout the whole ordeal and without incident to almost pass out. We drove through the night and parked in a shopping center parking lot just to try and gather our thoughts, trying to process what happened. We even debated whether or not we should report this to local authorities, but we decided against it. Morning eventually broke, and we mustered up enough courage to return to our campsite, with the hopes of retrieving some of our belongings. However, when we arrived at the scene, where only hours before chaos had ensued, there was no trace left behind. No tent poles scattered about, nor any remnants from last night's fire pit could be found anywhere within vicinity. It was as if the creatures had taken everything, leaving no evidence of their existence or our terrifying encounter. Overwhelmed by a mixture of relief and disbelief, we just got back in the truck and drove home in silence. The events of that night would forever stay with us, a reminder of the unknown. In years that would follow, we would rarely speak about our experience with anyone outside of our tiny circle. We knew that most people, had we told them the truth, they would simply dismiss it as a product of overactive imagination, drugs, beer, hallucinations, paranoia, you name it. But we knew what we saw and heard that night. It was something that would defy any rational thought or explanation. It challenged our understanding of science and biology. Now, as time went on, we actually started coming across stories online about what people would refer to as dogmen, often citing canine beings that are large and bipedal, while we can never be sure if other stories were true or simply urban legends fueled by fear and fascination, they did serve as a reminder that we were not the only ones. Now, even now, I still find myself sometimes looking over my shoulder when I'm only in the woods for a brief time. I always wonder if I'll run into them again, and I might not come out alive. It all started as a usual Saturday with a very close friend of mine. We had set out for a hike in the Pisgah National Forest. It was our favorite spot, with all of its dense wilderness and scenic trails. We had been exploring the forest for, well, years now, and we felt pretty comfortable in the area. As dedicated weekend explorers, we enjoyed fresh air peaceful environments, and the occasional wildlife sighting. But this trip would prove to be different than our usual hikes. We began it early in the morning. This way we could avoid the heat of the day. The sun was just starting to rise, casting a soft golden light on the trees and illuminating the path before us. We chatted about our mundane week at work, and looked forward to a much-needed break in nature. The trails were relatively quiet, and we reveled in that early morning serenity. A couple of hours into our hike, we came across a fork in the road. To the left was an unmarked game trail that we'd never explored before. Well, curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to venture down this new path. As we walked... We noticed that the trees almost seemed to grow thicker, and the atmosphere, it felt somewhat different than our usual trails. And just around noon, we came upon a clearing. In the middle stood a strange-looking tree. It was twisted, with what I can only describe as dark, scaly bark. It seemed really out of place among the surrounding landscape. As we approached, an unpleasant odor had filled the air. 
This made both of us pretty uncomfortable. We decided to rest and eat our packaged lunch at a safe distance from that tree. Jake, my friend, noticed something odd. My name was carved on the trunk of the tree. And even more disturbing, the exact date of that same day underneath my name, as if somebody was here earlier with the same name. Making a quick joke that we had randomly made our own carvings, this carving looked distinctly different from my own. It made me grow incredibly uneasy. I tried to brush off my worries and focus on the beauty of the forest that surrounded us. So, we decided to continue. The sun was starting to set, and we realized that we should probably head back just to avoid being stranded in the woods at nighttime. After all, what I saw really made me uncomfortable. It made us increase our pace back towards the known trail. On the way, we heard a few strange noises coming from the nearby bushes. We stopped, our eyes trying to adjust to the darkness, searching for the cause of the noise. This is when we saw something we cannot explain, for a tall, thin figure had emerged from the foliage its eyes shining like reflectors in the waning light. We held our breath, not knowing what to expect. The figure remained still for a moment before turning around with an uh-oh, I've been spotted expression. We can make out very little of its features, except for how unusually tall and thin it was. Our legs felt weak, but we knew we needed to get out of there immediately. We quickly retraced our steps, practically running back to the familiarity of the trail that led us toward our car. We did not speak. We were on edge for most of the time, until we reached the false safety of the parking lot. Once inside the car, we finally caught our breath and equally voiced our shared disbelief. Who or what was that figure? We couldn't be sure, but... We agreed on one thing. We were certainly never going back to that same unmarked trail ever again. So that's when I got the research itch. I decided to hop on Reddit here and wanted to know if anyone out there has seen something similar. To my recollection, it was tall, white, and gaunt. I don't think it was a person, but what else could it have been? I've heard some people mention the term skinwalker or wendigo, but I'm not exactly sure what that is or if that's what we saw. Any answers would help us greatly. Thank you so much. I grew up around the Apache Reservation in Arizona, and let me tell you, there's a whole lot of nothing out there, but there is a lot of weird stuff that happens. And that's what my story is centered around. Nothing scary like monsters in the woods or aliens coming down to abduct you, but something out of place. Sometimes, you'll find something that makes you stop and wonder what the heck is going on. Now, my family owned a small ranch just outside the reservation. And I spent a lot of my childhood years exploring those wide open spaces. Now, as an adult, with a penchant for whiskey and storytelling, I find myself reminiscing about one particular incident that still bothers me to this day. It was on one of those hot afternoons where the air felt like it was trying to smother you with its embrace. My buddy Travis and I were out riding our horses near an old abandoned mine, and we came across something peculiar— there, right in the middle of nowhere, stood a perfectly intact phone booth. Now keep in mind, this was long before cell phones became everyone's lifeline. So finding a phone booth way out here was like stumbling upon an oasis in the desert. And it was in immaculate condition. It looked like it was brand new and had just been stuck here. Travis, of course, looked at me with raised eyebrows and said, Well, ain't that something? His voice dripping with sarcasm. We both laughed, 
but decided to check it out anyway because why not? As we got closer, though, things started to get weird. First off, there wasn't any road or path leading up to this phone booth, just desert as far as the eye could see. And secondly, probably the weirdest thing, there was no telephone lines connected to it. The thing seemed to be just standing there all by itself like some sort of mirage. I dismounted my horse and cautiously approached the booth while Travis hung back with his usual devil-may-care attitude. I opened the door and noticed a faint burnt smell. I found that not only was there an actual working phone inside, but also a thick phone book filled with names and numbers I didn't recognize. Addresses that didn't make sense. Feeling equal parts still curious and unnerved, I picked up the receiver, expecting to hear nothing but silence on the other end. Instead, I was greeted with a dial tone. I looked back at Travis, who just shrugged and said, Go on then, give it a call. I decided to humor him and dial my own home phone number. To my astonishment, the call went through and my mother answered on the other end. We exchanged a few confused words before I hung up, not wanting to waste any more time or money on this bizarre event. As we rode away from that phone booth, I couldn't help but feel like we had stumbled upon something that wasn't meant for us to find. It felt as if we had trespassed into some hidden corner of reality where logic and reason held no sway. The entire time, I felt like I shouldn't have been there, that there was something wrong about it. Travis and I couldn't stop talking about this mysterious phone booth as we continued to ride through the desert. We even joked about calling long-lost relatives or maybe even the president himself from that lonely outpost. As the sun began to dip, painting the sky with hues of orange and red, we decided to make camp for the night near an old, dried-up riverbed. The air had cooled down just enough for us to build a small fire, without the fear of burning down half of Arizona. As we sat there under the stars, sipping whiskey from a shared flask and swapping old stories, we still couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The night seemed darker than usual, as if all light was being swallowed up by some unseen force. And there was this strange sense of being watched, like there were eyes out here in the darkness studying our every move. Neither Travis nor I were easily spooked. After all, we'd grown up in these parts and knew every nook and cranny like the back of our hands. But that night felt different somehow. We eventually drifted off to sleep despite our unease, only to be awoken sometime around midnight by a sound that scared us. It was faint at first, almost indifferent against the backdrop of howling wind and rustling brush, but it soon grew louder until it became impossible to ignore. It sounded like ringing, a telephone ringing out there in the dark desert night. Travis and I exchanged nervous glances before grabbing our lights and heading in the direction where we had found the phone booth earlier that day. We were pretty unnerved, and we moved cautiously through the moonlit landscape, guided only by memory and intuition. We finally reached the spot where the phone booth had stood. Our flashlights revealed that it was gone, vanished without a trace. All that remained was a small patch of flattened sand and an eerie silence that almost seemed to mock our disbelief. We searched the area for any sign of what might have happened to this inexplicable structure. Perhaps a truck came by and picked it up, but there was no tire tracks, no foot tracks. But there was nothing, no debris, no indication whatsoever that it had even been there in the first place. Defeated and a little more than scared, we made our way back to camp and tried to get some sleep by downing more whiskey. And every time I closed my eyes, 
I couldn't shake the image of that darn phone booth standing alone in the desert like some sort of twisted monument. The next morning, we packed up our gear and rode back home. We didn't talk much on the journey. I think both Travis and I were trying to make sense of what we'd experienced out there in the desert. Neither of us have been able to come up with any sort of satisfactory explanation for what happened. That phone booth remains a great mystery to me. And sometimes, when I'm sitting around a fire with friends or nursing a glass of whiskey, I can't help but wonder if maybe, just maybe, someone else is out there in those wilds stumbling upon the same damn phone booth. Growing up in this little town in Massachusetts, and me and my buddy Mikey would always go out venturing in the woods behind our houses. We were just a couple of knuckleheads, maybe 13 or 14 years old at the time. I mean, what else are you going to do when you're stuck in a small town with nothing but trees for miles and miles? Anyway, one day in August, we decided to venture deeper than we ever had before. It was like an adventure straight out of Stand By Me, or something. Except without the dead body, thank God. So we packed our backpacks with some sandwiches and sodas, and set off on our grand expedition. We must have been walking for hours, going further and further into the unknown until we stumbled upon an old, creepy, abandoned homestead just sitting there in the middle of nowhere to rot. Now look, I know what you're thinking. This is how every horror movie starts, and believe me, I thought the same thing too. But being young and dumb, we couldn't resist taking a peek inside. The front door creaked like a stereotypical old abandoned house, something straight out of a haunted house flick, there was dusty old dilapidated furniture, things covered in cobwebs, and mainly just shattered glass. We looked around, but we didn't really know what we'd find. There really wasn't much left. It looked like there was fresh cigarette butts and spray paint. We decided to explore more, and Mikey suddenly froze in his tracks near an old fireplace that looked like it hadn't seen flames in years. He pointed towards an ancient-looking painting hanging above it. It was this creepy portrait of some old dude with antlers growing out of his head. I'll never forget that one. Now let me tell you, I'm not one to spook easily, but the paintings gave me some serious heebie-jeebies, like nobody's business. But Mikey, gosh, the kid had other ideas. He wanted to take it home as some sort of twisted souvenir. I tried to talk him out of it, but he insisted, saying that we'd come all this way and might as well have something to show for it. So, against my better judgment, we took the painting down and headed back home. As we made our way through the woods, we started hearing these weird noises, like branches snapping, heavy footfalls, and leaves rustling behind us. We were convinced that the squatter who was living there was following us. I kept telling Mikey that we should ditch the painting and get out of here, but he stubbornly refused, and the further we went, the more paranoid I became. I swear, I could feel eyes on me from every direction, and after what felt like forever, we had made it back to our neighborhood, and just in time too, because this was the day and age where, if the streetlights came on and you weren't home, you'd get a whooping. That night, as I lay in bed trying to shake off the creepiness of the day's events, I got a call from Mikey. He sounded terrified out of his mind. Apparently, ever since he brought the darn painting home with him, strange things were happening. His door was slamming shut by itself, and a few things had thrown off his desk by themselves. That's when we agreed to meet up. The plan was to take the painting back to the old house, because apparently it was cursed or something. Now, I actually didn't go with Mikey to take it back, and I don't think he took it all the way back. From what I remember him telling me is that he took the painting and walked out into the woods, I don't know how far in, and just set it there on the ground. 
Now, we didn't really check on it to see if someone came and got it, but, but after a few days had gone by, the painting was gone. So I can only assume that whoever or whatever was living there had come and taken it back. Now, from that day forward, Mikey nor I ever ventured that deep into those woods again. We stayed right along the tree line. And so if you ever find yourself in a similar situation, be careful, because we could have gotten seriously hurt, or worse, kidnapped. This story takes place at the house I lived in with my family for a majority of my life. This is my experience. My siblings and mother had other experiences living here. We rented and moved into a new house when I was around nine years old and left when I was 15. The owner had a dresser he was wondering if we wanted before he threw it away. My mother agreed and placed it into my room, so I had more room for my growing collection of clothing. The house was one floor, decent-sized, and you could hear when someone was walking from the complete opposite end of the house. My room was next to my sister's, which was the last door down the hallway. The bathroom was to my left, and further up was a break-off where my mother slept, and across was my brother's room, then the front door was adjacent. The kitchen was directly opposite my sister's room down the hallway, next to my mother's room, the kitchen, without a door blocking it off. Connected to the lounge area, which had a sliding door, which to our medium-sized backyard, which held another room. I'd call it a granny flat, but we threw junk in there because it had asbestos no one could sleep in there. From my room, I could see a portion of the garage, the whole backyard and the lounge area. But beyond the lounge room, there was a short hallway that had a door to another room. We used it as a gaming room, enough to fit a single person, and a laundry was at the end of the hallway that opened to the backyard also. I'm giving a layout to better get an understanding of the layout of the house, to give a visual representation. Most of these occurrences are very blurred with how old I was and the years difference, so bear with me. I was probably roughly 13 when this happened. My bed was in the back corner of the room. I had a gap and against the wall was the dresser. The dresser had one side that would open randomly for some reason. I would place a padlock on it so it wouldn't open. I mean, I never locked it. I didn't have a key, and it did the job I needed it to. It was very late. I was in bed trying to sleep when I heard fingernails scratching down the door. I felt chills go up my spine as I lay listening to it happening over and over. Soon, I realized there was heavy breathing echoing out of the old dresser. I ignored it and fell back to sleep. But the next night, the same thing happened. I tried to sleep. I heard the nails, but I heard my dresser click and opened slowly as it made a loud creaking noise when it opened. I knew the sound well because it opened every time the padlock was not holding it shut. I lay feeling my body slightly shake. I knew I had put that padlock on the door. I do it every night. I remember looking towards the door, and where my clothes usually are, was complete, horrifying darkness. I felt all my anxieties rise inside me as my eyes widened. I felt freezing. I heard a deep exhale, and my eyes watered from fear as I stare into whatever it was. I hid under the covers, closed my eyes, trying my best to calm my breathing. I woke up the next morning, sat up like I forgot what had happened, and it all rushed back to me when I saw the padlock on my bedside table and the door to the wardrobe open. Another incident happened when my mother left the house with my siblings. I was home alone. 
I took a swig of water, lifted my cup, placed it onto the counter. I felt a weird chill and heard shuffling from the gaming room. The room I felt the spirits in my house were. It was always a lot colder than the rest of our house, and I always felt eyes staring at me. I stepped back, heard the door to that room creaking open. I felt my body tremble, and I bolted from my room. I slammed my door shut, locked it, and sat on my bed against the wall. Silence. I hear a thump, thump, thump. Crash! I jumped at that sound, like glass hitting wood. I wish I recorded this, but I only had bad technology and was scared out of my mind. This was before everybody filmed their whole life and at the ready with a phone. It started slow. When you begin to run in a startup, it ran from the sound where the glass shattered right to my door. Heavy, loud, angry footsteps charging right for me. It felt as if everything was closing in on me, and it smacked right into my door like an angry animal. I jumped, tried to hide further back, but there was nowhere to go. I sat there for a while, messaging my mother after a long time of silence. I hear the front door open, loud conversations and my mother calling out to me to help. She walked into the kitchen, me behind her, and the glass I drank out of lay on the floor, broken. The last incident that was imprinted into my brain was the night I woke up. Groggy and confused as I heard shuffling through these open square-shaped boxes I had containing books, papers, my phone, etc. I rolled over and saw a dark figure with long hair going through my things. I called out my brother's name, and there was no reply. I called to my mother. No reply. I sat up slightly, cleared my throat, and it clicked as it stared right at me. Darkness covering its face, hair a crazy mess, and it was tall. It stood up tall, and the heavy breathing swarmed me. I threw the covers over my head and rolled over, crying at this point and shaking. I tried to calm myself and eventually fell asleep. They are the three main things that happened over the years. But there were always footsteps, eyes on me, scratching, and sometimes someone would touch me in my sleep. The scariest thing in that wardrobe, messily cut into it, was a name I only remember, Elizabeth. But it's been a long time since I lived there, and I'm in a new house, which gives me the creep sometimes, but not as bad as that house. I compiled two different theories. A man who ran around the house in boots, and a woman in my bedroom. I don't know if the people now living there have issues, but I am glad I'm out of there, and glad they did not follow me if they could. When my brother and I were really, really young, I remember my mother taking us to our mountain house all the time. We hated it, because most of the time, she made us go and none of our friends were there, so we were bored mostly. She would tell us it's for our own good. The air up there is much better than in our polluted city, which is true. Nowadays, I really love going up there. Except now, I go with my friends, and it's always fun. One time, when we were up there, I think we were 13 or 14, I remember being really bored, so I convinced my mother to let me and my brother go out and explore the woods behind the home. We didn't go in that deep, and next to the trail in the woods nearby, I noticed a fallen tree that made a perfect little hiding spot. It was like a tree house, but was built there. It was basically just a tree that was knocked down, and its branches resembled a roof and underneath there was a little bit of grass. I figured we could bring a blanket, and it would be our little treehouse. The next day, 
we brought our equipment. I prepared a blanket, some decorations made of paper, and a few glasses if we got thirsty. My brother brought some toys, so we wouldn't be so bored. We spent all of our time in the treehouse from then on. We would go back to the house occasionally, so that my mother wouldn't get too worried. One day, our neighbor came to his cottage, and we showed him our house in the woods as well. He was pretty amazed by it, but his parents didn't let him stick around for long. Now that we have made this discovery, we didn't really want to go home anymore. But we had to go to school, and Mom promised us we would come back again for the weekend. I literally couldn't wait for all the upcoming weekends so that we could go back and work on our house. Every time we went there, we would build it a little bit more and add things to it. Now, about two months later, my mother and I went to the mountains alone. My mother didn't really want me to go into the woods alone, but I managed to convince her that I would just be fine. As I was approaching my little treehouse, I noticed a black coat through the branches, and I got a little confused because I don't remember that we left any coats in there. When I got to my house, I froze in fear because the coat turned out to be a person sitting in my treehouse. It was an older man in his late 30s, and he was just as surprised to see me as I was him. He asked me what I was doing there, and I explained that the house and everything inside belonged to me and my brother. The man found it very cute and said he wouldn't touch anything, and he just needed somewhere to rest for a while because he had traveled a long way. I was a little scared and I said goodbye to the man and hurried back home. When I got out of the woods, I ran and told my mom all about our house and what happened. She was mad, especially because she didn't seem to know the man I described and really anything could have happened. I was never going to go there alone again and I was scared I couldn't sleep the entire night. Me and my mom were alone in the cottage. I kept imagining the man knocking on our doors and doing something. Me and my brother went to the house with my mother again to pick up our things, but they were all ruined because it had rained at some point. My mother gave us a long lecture about doing things without her knowing. There was no one there when we went, and no trace of the man I saw previously. We did hear an animal that my mother could not identify in the distance. It was like it was screaming in pain, and it was really creepy. So we went back to the cottage. My mom forbid us ever going back again or even approaching the woods, and for good reason. A few months went by, and my family was watching the news one night when a picture of a man appeared. It said that he was the main suspect in the murder of a woman, who was apparently his wife, and that he had been missing for two months now. I almost threw up when I realized why that man looked so familiar. It was the guy I saw in our treehouse that day when I went there alone. I told my mom right away, and she called the police to report a sighting. As the newsman kept talking, I was more and more grateful to God that he saved me from anything that could have happened that day. I mean, I was only a 13-year-old girl, and the man could have easily done something to me or hurt me, especially because he was on the run from police and I had already seen him. If my mom had reported him that day when I told her about what had happened, they would have definitely caught him. But something stopped her from doing that just like something probably stopped the man from killing me. He definitely knew that I was a big liability and that I could get him caught, but he still decided to let me go. My family was very invested in this investigation and seeing if they could ever catch him. To this day, the man has not been found and the case is not closed. Even now, ten years later, I still get nightmares and can't sleep. I still feel like he's out there somewhere. August 1st, 2021 marks one of the strangest trips I've ever had near Boulder, Colorado. 
something which none of us will forget. Now, before I tell you this really long story, let me tell you a bit about myself and my family. I've been going in the great outdoors since I was young, and I've always enjoyed camping trips to various national parks. It's somewhat of a tradition. Now that I'm married and have children, my husband Tom and I are eager to pass on our love for nature by taking our children on these adventures with us as well. My kids are Jack and Lily, and they also share our enthusiasm. Now, on to the day in question. We had decided to visit Lower Mill Pond. We had heard from friends just how beautiful it was. The area was teeming with wildlife, and a serene pond that made it the perfect spot for a getaway. As we arrived, we were immediately captivated. The shallow creek meandering through the landscape provided a peaceful soundtrack to our exploration. We decided to set up camp near the water, hoping that its proximity would allow us to better observe the animals that call this place home. Shortly after settling in, we spotted a bull moose and two young ones grazing along the banks of the creek. We watched in awe as they moved gracefully through the water, nibbling on aquatic plants while keeping a watchful eye on their surroundings. I didn't know that bull moose were actually in this part of Colorado. Maybe I'm wrong. The sighting of these magnificent creatures had already made our trip worthwhile. Now as evening approached, Jack and Lily were ecstatic and had forced it on us that they were going to explore without our permission. Me and Tom reluctantly said yes, and they went about looking for anything. Within 20 minutes, they were calling us over on a dry creek bed. They had stumbled upon something truly bizarre. Several large three-toed prints had been left there in the earth. Tracks that resembled a dinosaur. Well, similar to our size of feet or a large bird. As an outdoor enthusiast, Tom and I had seen our share of tracks, but nothing like these. Feeling both fascinated and unnerved by this, we decided to look further. Jack and Lily led us back to where they first noticed the prints. Tom then carefully studied them while I documented their measurements. It was fascinating. The tracks went deeper into the woods as dusk turned into nightfall. With each step we took eastward towards the tree line, did we seem to get a feeling that we were being watched by unseen eyes, perhaps belonging to whatever had made these odd footprints. But we weren't really scared. It was just weird. As if on cue, piercing, screeching noises were echoing through the trees from several directions at once. These cries were chilling, and unlike anything we had heard, they made the hairs on the backs of our necks stand on end. Reluctantly, we decided it was best to return to our campsite for safety reasons. We sat around the campfire that evening. We couldn't help but discuss what we had experienced. Was there a connection between those tracks and the eerie screeching? Could they have been made by an unknown species native to these woods? Or perhaps even something far more strange? The night wore on, and we soon found ourselves in our sleeping bags trying to shake off the day's events. However, sleep did not come easy that night. From our campsite on the west ridge of mountains, we were suddenly jolted awake by what sounded like a large pine tree being violently shaken back and forth. The force of this commotion was enough to send tremors to the ground beneath us. We all emerged from our shelter, peering into the darkness. Whatever had caused that disturbance was undoubtedly powerful. But just what was it? We were scanning the surrounding landscape for any signs of movement or unusual activity. I remembered a similar incident from years past. It was during another family camping trip near Trout Lake in Washington. We had heard an unexplained loud thud coming from deep within those woods one evening. 
some folks around us suggested it might have been caused by a Bigfoot. Could there be a connection between these two incidents? Were they simply cases of wild animals behaving unusually, or evidence of something much more elusive? Well, I told this story to one of my best friends, and she told me that her and her husband had a really weird experience up in the same area. It was a few years back, and they had decided to do an impromptu weekend camping trip. They were eager to explore and just get away and have some quality time together. Life at home, I guess, was getting very stressful. The first day of their trip went smoothly. They hiked through some of the trails and checked out some of the surrounding vistas. As night fell, they returned to their campsite, feeling tired but excited. That night, they heard strange sounds around them. Karen recalled, my friend, how she was awoken by eerie tapping noises outside their tent. At first, she dismissed it as just another critter, possibly foraging for food. However, the tapping persisted and seemed to grow louder, and she couldn't shake off the nagging feeling that it was something else entirely. Gently, she nudged Dave awake and whispered her concerns. Now he too became increasingly uneasy as he began listening in. The sounds were coming from just outside their tent. With caution and trepidation, Dave unzipped the tent flap ever so slightly to take a peek outside, hoping it would reveal nothing more than maybe a curious raccoon or a possum or some other harmless woodland critter. But what he saw left him dumbstruck. There stood an impossibly tall figure, green and scaly and hideous. Dave claimed that it reminded him of a serpent, or serpent-like. He quickly fled back in the tent, zipped the tent up, and sat there as the tapping continued. The couple remained in their tent paralyzed as they listened to these unnerving noises continue for probably another couple hours. Eventually the sounds ceased and faded off into the distance. They could no longer sense the presence of whatever this was. They were very shaken by this and decided to cut the rest of their trip short. They had never really spoken about what happened until, of course, I told her my story, which prompted her to open up and tell me her story. I'm not a biology expert, but there's something really freaking weird going on around there. I've always felt like a bit of an outdoorsman. Growing up in the beautiful state of California, it's hard not to be drawn to the natural wonders that surround you. Towering redwoods in the north to the sun-kissed beaches in the south, there is really no shortage of variety of landscapes for one to explore. But my favorite place has always been Forest Hill, located near Auburn. There's just something about this area that really calls out to me. Perhaps it's the dense foliage or the never-ending forest. This is where I've had many memorable adventures as a young man. Now, let me tell you about what happened on October 2nd. My friends and I decided we needed a break from our daily routines. We considered a day trip to Forest Hill. This was going to be a blast. So off we went, four souls eager for adventure and excitement. As we made our way along one of our favorite trails, we stumbled upon something strange on the ground. At first glance, it appeared to be nothing more than a large branch, but upon closer inspection, its shape seemed rather odd, almost like an elongated foot with strange toe patterns. Curiosity peaked. We decided to move this bizarre object into the water nearby before continuing onward with our hike. We pressed forward until eventually reaching a dead end within the trail. Disappointed but undeterred, we began retracing our steps back towards where we had started earlier in the day. 
It wasn't long before things got weird. As we're making our way back through, now bathed in shadows cast by the late afternoon sunlight, off in the distance ahead of us, we all saw something. A dark figure moving and making strange noises. The sight of this stopped us all in our tracks. We were nervous. Was it a bear? Or so that's what I was thinking. We decided to approach cautiously, but as we drew closer, the figure seemed to vanish into thin air, leaving behind a silence broken occasionally by those strange sounds we had heard earlier echoing through the forest around us. We were very disturbed by this, not knowing exactly what we had just saw, since nothing we know vanishes into thin air. My friends and I resolved to return later, armed with a gun, just in case it was a person. When we returned to the scene, after arming ourselves, we began examining the ground more closely, where the dark figure had been spotted previously. We didn't really find anything, except... To our astonishment, we found what appeared to be footprints from something unknown. Now this was right by the trail side, and was at least 15 to 16 inches. A very unusual foot and toe pattern and deep indentation. These prints were unlike anything we'd ever seen. Massive in size, and quite human in shape. However... The biggest thing that set them apart is that unless there is a giant basketball player walking around in the woods, I really doubt what we encountered was human. I've been fishing in these Georgia waters for over 50 years now. I've seen things that most folks would never believe. But there's one story that sticks with me. One experience I still can't explain to this day. It happened back in 92, a few years before I retired from the fishing business. I was out on my personal boat, the Miss Betty, just off the coast of Savannah. I saw something in the water that stopped me in my tracks. It was well below the surface, a bright light, like nothing I'd ever seen before. And it was moving underneath the water, through the waves and the current, like it was alive. It didn't really have much of a shape other than a large, round ball of light, if that makes sense. I realized there was something extremely strange going on. I knew I had to keep my eyes open if I wanted to get to the bottom of it. You see, I was born and raised in these parts. I've been fishing since I was old enough to hold a rod, My daddy was a fisherman, too. He taught me everything I know about the sea. When I was a boy, we used to spend long, lazy days out on the water, pulling in all kinds of fish and telling stories about the big ones that got away. But as I got older, I started to notice that things were changing. The sea didn't appear to be as bountiful as it used to be. There were days where it felt like we were lucky to catch anything at all. And I wondered if there was something going on. Something beyond my understanding. Now, that's a separate thought from what actually happened. Now, this light that I had saw, it was like nothing I'd ever seen. It was this bright, pulsating glow. And it seemed to be coming from deeper and deeper. Now, I watched it in awe from the side of my boat as it began to pulsate and grow brighter and brighter. At times, it was almost blinding. I remember feeling a sense of unease wash over me, like I was witnessing something that I wasn't supposed to see. But even as my heart started to race, I couldn't tear my eyes away. It was like it was drawing me in, beckoning to me, trying to communicate something to me that I couldn't quite understand. I'm serious when I say that it had some sort of hold over me. The pulsating light began to rise up from the water, and I could see that the shape was far more massive than I could have thought. 
something that was now at least 50 feet below the surface. It stopped, and I could feel what I would describe as waves of electricity coursing through my body, like I was standing near a lightning bolt. Then there was this deafening boom, but it was extremely muffled, like 1,000 cannons firing all at once, but underwater. There was a shockwave, though, and it knocked me off my feet and sent the Miss Betty rocking from side to side violently. I remember thinking that this was it. This was the end. This was a submarine. That whatever was causing this light was going to blow me and my ship up. But just as suddenly as it had appeared, the light completely vanished. Only darkness and quiet remained. After the light disappeared and the loud shockwave boom, I was suddenly overcome by the most intense wave of nausea and dizziness I ever had. I nearly fell off the boat. It was like the very air around me had turned into fire. My lungs were burning. I couldn't breathe. The air was toxic. My head was spinning and my vision was blurred. I began to bleed out my mouth my nose, my ears, and eyes. I staggered to the side of the boat, retching blood, feeling like my insides were trying to escape. For a moment, I was convinced I was going to die all alone out here at sea. But somehow, I managed to stay conscious, clinging to the side of the boat as the world around me spun and whirled. This went on for probably 15 to 20 minutes, it was like I was caught in the grip of some kind of horrible unearthly force, something beyond my comprehension. With every ounce of strength I had left, I managed to get the Miss Betty moving toward shore. It felt like every wave was trying to knock me back, like the sea itself was angry at me for seeing something that I was not meant to see. Now I want to note here that while coming out here, the sea was relatively calm, and within a matter of no more than 30 minutes after that loud shockwave underwater, the sea had erupted in violence, hard waves like a storm crashing against me. Even the wind picked up. There was no rain, though. As I neared the shore, I felt a sudden and intense feeling of dread, like if I didn't get back to land, I was going to perish at sea. It was like the ocean was wanting to claim me, to drag me down into its depths and never let me go. But I pushed the feeling aside, telling myself that I was just imagining things, that the light had just been a trick of the sea. Now once I got back on land, the weeks that followed that strange encounter were some of the worst of my life. I was honestly convinced I had developed a terminal cancer. I was plagued by dizzy spells and fainting fits. My body would randomly show strange, painful burns that I couldn't explain. It was like this light had left its mark on me. Like it was trying to tell me something I did not want to hear. At night, I would lie awake, staring up at the ceiling, trying to make sense of what happened all while writhing in agony of pain. I felt like I was losing my grip on reality. I began hallucinating, hearing things that weren't there, seeing strange shapes that weren't there. I felt like my reality was being pulled in two different directions. Doctors could not find out what was wrong with me, but I'll get to that in a moment. On one hand, I wanted to forget the whole thing, to push it to the back of my mind and pretend like it never happened. But on the other hand, I knew deep down that something inside me had changed, like after seeing something that couldn't be explained away, that my interior makeup was different. Now, the day that I did go to see doctors, the first one took one look at me and was telling me he was convinced that I had been exposed to high levels of radiation, judging by my condition and the symptoms that I had. He could not explain the burns or the dizzy spells, but he was sure that they were a result 
of some kind of radiation poisoning. Perhaps I was out on the ocean where there were high amounts of toxic waste being dumped. Of course, I never told any of the doctors what I actually saw. That would have been a one-way ticket to the kooky bin. I remember feeling a mix of relief and fear at his diagnosis, though. On one hand, it was a relief to have some kind of explanation, but on the other, it confirmed my worst fears, that there truly was something out there, something beyond my understanding, that I didn't just hallucinate the whole thing, something capable of doing this. Now, recently, I've heard a lot of claims about UFOs being spotted underwater, but I try to remain skeptical. I mean, nowadays, it's easy to get caught up in conspiracy theories and speculation, but I can't defy what I saw. It's something that doesn't make sense, something I can't explain away as a natural phenomenon or a trick of lights and shadows. I don't know what it was, though. I don't know where it came from or why it was there. It honestly scares me more than anything else. It's like there's this whole other world out there that we know nothing about. A world far beyond our understanding. And who knows what else is out there, waiting for us to discover it. I'll know that I'll never forget that evening. I feel like it's always going to be a part of me, whether I want it to be or not. Anyway, this old man will stop ranting for now. Thank you for hearing me. 2005. I was in Hawaii on a snorkeling trip, and I had the time of my life with my family. The water was crystal clear, and there were plenty of exotic fish to admire. The sun was beating down on the ocean, and its crystal clear water sparkled as I slipped into the cool depths, feeling at home with all of the vibrant, beautiful tropical life around me. Colorful coral stretched along the bottom of the sea, and the fish everywhere were fitting around to explore. It felt amazing to be a part of this underwater world. I quickly forgot any fears that had been creeping up inside of me. Above me, there was a never-ending blue sky, dotted with puffs of white clouds, lazily drifting by. Rays of sunshine streamed through the surface water, making it shimmer like diamonds. The serene atmosphere was perfect. Now, I soon realized, however, that my experience had come to an abrupt end. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a large shape moving out of the reef ahead, by maybe forty feet. I quickly scanned the surroundings, desperately searching for what it could be. My first thought was that I was just seeing things, that this was just a rock formation. But it moved. I became certain that this wasn't a rock formation, but a living thing. As it moved, I assured myself. Its body was covered in these black spines, and it moved with an incredible speed. Panic filled my chest as I realized this wasn't an octopus, but an octopus or a squid-like animal. My heart raced as fear paralyzed me in place while watching this thing. It moved so quickly and boldly. This thing had now reached a small patch of coral just ahead of me, and suddenly... Its body shifted in direction as it seemed to vanish in midair, emitting this loud, ear-piercing sound that physically stunned me. I know, not much of a sea monster tale, but whatever sound it made actually caused me to have heart problems. A bizarre and strange correlation to draw, I know. Prior to this, I've never had anything wrong with my heart. After I got out of the water, I told a few what I saw, which they thought was interesting. The octopus, or squid, wasn't huge, maybe seven foot in length and maybe a few feet in height, if I had to guess. I'll never forget those black spines on it, though. And 
the sound that it emitted felt more like a wave of energy going through my body. The same kind of energy you feel on the impact of a car crash. A sonic boom is what I think some call it. For the next couple of days, I actually had pretty bad heart problems, like shortness of breath, extreme chest pains to name a couple. Long story short, it turns out I had heart damage. I'll save all the other medical issues, and I can't say for sure it's the exact cause, but the timing is certainly unquestionable. Whatever it was has me respecting things down in the water just a little bit more. I had spent around 10 years of my life living around eastern Texas, where my husband, our two kids, and I resided in a cozy little house surrounded and nestled in a grove of tall, ancient oak trees. They had been there long before we ever moved in. Their branches intertwined above our home, creating a canopy that shielded us from the harsh sun that cast dappled shadows across our yard. The exterior of our home was painted a warm, buttery yellow. It contrasted beautifully with the greenery surrounding it. A white picket fence encircled the property, giving it an almost storybook feel. Our front porch, adorned with hanging ferns and rocking chairs, was the perfect spot for lazy afternoons while my husband and I watched our kids play out in the yard. Now inside our home was a pretty typical family home, filled with lots of love and laughter, but I will spare you those mundane, unimportant details. It was during one of these afternoons when something unusual happened, something that still really, really upsets me. My husband and I were lounging on the living room couch, discussing plans for an upcoming family vacation, and suddenly we noticed flickers of an eerie orange glow reflecting off of a picture frame near the window. We both exchanged puzzled glances before we decided to investigate. Now, as I opened the front door, I saw my eight-year-old daughter standing at the edge of our fence. Her eyes were wide with terror, and she was trembling and crying, unable to tear her gaze away from something that seemed to be hovering just above the ground. I'd asked her what was wrong, and at this point, I was on edge, but I tried to keep calm and my voice steady. She pointed towards the trees, her hand shaking uncontrollably. She said, Mommy, there's a... a thing. It's floating and it has huge, dark eyes. I squinted into the shadows, trying to make out what had frightened her so much. And then I saw it. There was a dark figure, about four feet tall, with this strange orange glow surrounding it. It had massive eyes that seemed to pierce right through both of us, and it floated eerily above the ground. Now my protective instincts kicked in immediately. I didn't have time to ask questions. I felt that me and my daughter were both in danger. So I grabbed her hand, pulling her inside the house. My husband bolted the door with paddles at his heels, and he was determined to confront whatever this was. As my husband and Puddles ventured out into the yard, I held my daughter close, trying to calm her down. She clung to me tightly, sobbing into my shoulder. I could feel her heart racing against mine, and I couldn't help but worry about what was lurking outside. From our living room window, we watched as my husband cautiously approached the spot where we had seen the thing. Puddles sniffed around intently, his ears perked up, and his tail wagging nervously. My husband scanned the area. I could tell he was apprehensive, but he continued. The air inside the house was feeling very thick with tension. My daughter continued to tremble in my arms. I tried to reassure her that everything would be okay, but deep down... I wasn't so sure myself. After probably about ten minutes, my husband returned to the house, Puddles trotting by his side. 
He looked puzzled, but mostly unharmed. He said he couldn't find anything, but spoke it with a sigh of relief. He claimed that whatever it must have been had disappeared. We spent the rest of the evening discussing what could have caused such a strange occurrence. We considered every possibility, from an elaborate prank orchestrated by neighborhood kids to maybe some sort of optical illusion created by the shadows and light. But there was no explanation that seemed to fit. Although we tried our best to put it behind us and return to our normal lives, there was a lingering sense of dread that settled in our home like a dense fog. But, fortunately, over time, life finds its way of resuming its familiar rhythm. School days filled with learning and laughter. Evenings spent gathered around the dinner table, sharing stories from the day, and weekends exploring or having picnics. Yet, despite our attempts to forget that encounter, there were moments when something would catch our eye. A flicker of movement in the corner of our vision of an unexpected flash of orange light. We would be reminded of what happened that day. And my daughter gradually overcame her fear and began to venture outside again. I would sometimes catch her staring off into the woods with a look of uneasiness on her face. I couldn't help but think that perhaps, somewhere deep in the woods, something was staring back at her. Within weeks, we started to notice strange things happening around the house, mostly with my daughter. There's a couple times during the night that she would wake up screaming, crying, complaining of horrific nightmares of this, what she would call the orange man, coming in through her window and grabbing her and taking her. And every time it would pick her up, she would wake up. She would complain of this electrical jolting sensation on the backs of her hands and her back. Very strange. And then, within a couple weeks of that, she began complaining and saying that there was whispers in her room and voices. The voices she did not recognize. She began to tell us that her room was haunted. My husband and I had no idea what to do, so we called a priest to come bless the house. Now the priest got there, heard our story. We didn't tell him about what had happened with the whole levitating orange figure, but we told him about what had happened recently with our daughter. As soon as he got to her room, his entire demeanor changed. He said there was a spirit in here, and he did his blessing and his prayers and said everything should be good now. After that, activity still happened, mainly just at night, but it eventually died down to the point where it seemed to stop entirely. And so we thought things were fine for the longest time. Now let's fast forward a bit. My daughter, having graduated from high school and freshly 18, had started her first year in college. She was living the dorm life with a few of her friends. And I'll never forget that cold night in November when she gave me a call. To preface, she would call me every week, right around the same time, on Tuesday nights. That was because her schedule then wasn't bombarded with homework, classes, and friends. And that's when she dropped the news. He's back. And I told her, what do you mean he's back? And she began to explain in detail that she had been having these horrific, vivid nightmares like she used to have back when she was a little girl. This orange man would climb through her window, would try to grab her and take her. And she was having those same nightmares again. Now keep in mind, she wasn't having any other trauma or nothing else horrific had happened in her life. She was also reporting strange voices in her dorm room. Well, long story short, a few months of living in that dorm room, she decided to switch dorms and everything was okay. As far as I know, nothing like that has happened with my daughter since then. And I have no way to describe or understand what caused what and why what I just described to you had happened. But maybe by sending this to you, you can give me some answers. Although I guess it doesn't really matter much now. 
My story isn't all that crazy, but I'll tell you anyway, because it is actually kind of funny. So, there I was in the middle of nowhere. You know, just like the time when I went to a vegan restaurant and asked for a cheeseburger. My buddy Jim, who is this obnoxiously fit hiker guy, had dragged me along on one of his insane hiking trips in the Adirondacks. I mean, what's wrong with staying at home and binge-watching TV like normal people? Anyway, we were coming down from some godforsaken mountain peak, Mount Kill Me Now or something, and we still had about six miles to go before reaching our car. Now, quick note, I have no idea how I made it this far, but it must have been the need for survival. And if there's anything worse than hiking up a mountain, it's hiking down one. Jim, being the self-righteous fitness freak he is, kept speeding ahead like some sort of marathon runner. Seriously? Just slow down and enjoy nature. So naturally, I'm left trailing behind like an asthmatic turtle with a heart condition. It wasn't exactly fun. Now I'm walking alone in the wilderness, and I suddenly hear these extra footsteps keeping pace with me in the woods. At first... I thought it might be another hiker who had got lost, or maybe even Jim finally realizing he should stick with his less athletic friend. But every time I turned to look, nothing, nada, zip. These phantom footsteps would stop when I stopped and start again when I moved forward. It was like having an invisible stalker with really bad timing. I couldn't shake off this eerie feeling of being watched or followed by something or someone. You know that creepy sensation you get when your mother-in-law comes over unannounced? Yeah, that kind. But instead of freaking out and getting all paranoid, which would have been totally understandable, I decided to channel my inner beatboxer and started making beats to motivate myself to keep going. Now picture this an out-of-shape guy beatboxing his way through the woods like some sort of delusional hip-hop artist. I'm pretty sure even Bigfoot would have been too embarrassed to be seen with me. But hey, it worked. I made it back to the car without any more weird incidents. Jim was already there, of course, looking all smug and refreshed. Ugh. So, you'd think that after reaching the car, everything would have gone back to normal. Right? Wrong. You see, it's almost as if the universe has a twisted sense of humor. As we're driving back home, with Jim going on and on about how amazing the hike was, I couldn't shake off the lingering feeling that something wasn't right. Like an itch you can't scratch, or when you forget your phone at home and feel naked without it. Now, a few days go by, I'm at home doing my usual routine of avoiding any form of physical activity, and I start hearing those footsteps again. Those same creepy footsteps from the woods. And now they're in my house. I thought at first that maybe it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Kind of like when you eat too much pizza before bed and have those bizarre dreams. But these phantom footsteps were real. Every time I walked around my house, there they were following me, like some sort of clingy ex-girlfriend who can't take a hint. And let me tell you, nothing makes you question your sanity more than having an invisible stalker living with you. So what do I do? Well, instead of calling a priest or ghost hunters, which might have been the logical thing to do, I decided to confront this unseen presence head-on. I stood in the middle of my living room and said, in my most assertive voice. All right, buddy, enough is enough. Either show yourself or get out of here. And guess what happened? Nothing. And then the footsteps stopped. Just like that. Poof. Now either my brave confrontation scared off whatever entity had taken an interest in me, or it realized that following a guy with a penchant for beatboxing and binge-watching TV was more boring than ever. Either way, I haven't heard those footsteps since, 
So that's my story. I'm sorry if it isn't all that exciting. It was the summer of 2005, if I can recall correctly, or somewhere right around there. I had just moved to Asheville, North Carolina, and was excited to explore the beautiful, amazing Pisgah National Forest. For you see, I had always been an outdoor enthusiast, and living near such a stunning place, for me, was a dream come true. I'm a North Cali boy by heart, and I've always wanted to come to the East Coast, so this was perfect. Now, I know the Pisgah is known for many things, like waterfalls and trails, and it just the woods out here in the East Coast are just different. Now, my close friend Sean had actually moved to Asheville a year before me and had convinced me to move out here. But that's not what this story is about. Because he had told me countless stories about his adventures in the Pisgah National Forest and even mentioned a few that weren't so great, like instances where he had witnessed some strange things in the woods, like odd noises and unexplained objects. So, we decided to head out on a weekend camping trip, eager to explore the trails together and see if maybe we could uncover anything unusual. We would set up camp at a clearing near a creek, the sound of the water providing a much-needed tranquil atmosphere. The campsite, surrounded by enough foliage, gave us enough privacy. Yet, we were still close enough to the main trail, so we didn't feel too isolated. The first day went off without a hitch. We hiked for probably about five hours, just enjoying the beauty of the forest and all of its impressive views that it offered. The day soon turned to evening, and we prepared our dinner by the campfire. We had beans and steak and vegetables. It was amazing. And, of course, we would tell stories of past hiking adventures and, of course, girls, and just pondering the mysteries of the forest. Night fell, we settled into our tents, and expected a peaceful and rather uneventful night. It was around midnight, and I was awakened by a strange rustling sound near the tent. Immediately, I panicked, thinking somebody was going through our stuff. I was still pretty groggy, so I was trying to get my bearings. I heard Sean's voice from his tent asking if I was hearing the noise. I spoke back to him, confirming I did. This is when we both got out of our tents at the same time to try and investigate. He had his flashlight, I had mine, we scanned the area cautiously, looking for the source of this noise. We moved deeper into the forest, because now the sound had moved. What initially had sounded like it was coming from our camp was actually now deeper in the woodline, as if the sound could somehow move on its own. It was very weird. But the sound seemed to grow louder and more distinct, like it was changing, It was now turning to an eerie, unidentifiable noise, unlike anything we'd ever heard. At this point, we were both pretty on edge. I don't know if I'd say scared, but I guess you could say that our curiosity overpowered our fear. We approached a small meadow, probably about 10 minutes after, and to our utter disbelief, we saw something unlike anything we could have imagined a peculiar, metallic-looking object in the clearing. It wasn't fully in view, though. It was partially obscured by the shadows of the trees. But it became clear that this was not something normal. Stunned, we stood frozen, unsure of what to do next or how to approach it or if we should even get close. Our eyes were just fixated on this mysterious object, trying to make sense of what we were seeing because it was so out of place. Now, almost instantaneously, we both heard a faint metallic clicking sound coming from the direction of this large object. We both panicked and agreed that it was time to retreat and return back to the safety of our tents. We didn't waste any time, and 
The thought of approaching that object, while curiosity was driving me to want to check it out, something inside me, call it my intuition, call it your gut instinct, whatever, something was telling me, do not go near it. And so we both turned around and we pretty quickly made our way back to our tents. And we couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone. Once we had made it back to our camp in probably around seven or so minutes, we quickly discussed what had just happened and kind of riffed back and forth on what we both think we should do. It was around midnight, like I said, and so we were both half asleep, very tired, and we decided that maybe it would be best to pack up right now and leave as quickly as we can. He offered that we could just crash out at his place. So I didn't really want to pack up then and there and leave because I was so tired, but I don't know exactly what we were near or dealing with. And as far as I could tell, the sounds were only growing in volume. So not wanting to linger there any longer than necessary, we just gathered up all of our stuff, threw it in, and just left. Now the whole ride back to Sean's place, as tired and exhausted as we were, we just kept going back and forth about what we had experienced and what it could have been, and was it maybe a military craft? Was this an alien thing? Was it a UFO? Was it maybe a just submerged object? We were not sure, but it defied explanation and it had no place being in that meadow. The only thing that I feel comfortable saying with certainty is that I got the impression it was some sort of machinery, hence the metallic clicking noise, but even that I can't confidently say for sure. It was early January when I decided to take a short vacation from my construction job, deciding to spend my free time camping in the Pisgah National Forest here in North Carolina. Well, I'm an avid camper, and I really cherished the quiet solitude of the woods and the opportunity to. I arrived at the designated camping area late in the afternoon, so I quickly set up my tent and campfire, eager to immerse myself in nature. But as the sun went down, the forest was enveloped in a cold, dark silence, different than usual. The only sounds around me were the crackling fire and the occasional rustling of leaves in the wind. After preparing and eating my dinner, I decided to go on a little night hike. I figured walking maybe a mile or two would help calm me down and just let me settle into bed. So I grabbed my light and a cigarette and set off on one of the well-marked trails, immersing myself in the crisp night air and the chorus of insects, which now seemed to be alive and well. Sometime around 9 p.m., while still walking on the trail, a dense fog began to roll in. This was not unusual for winter nights, so I continued on without much concern. However, as I ventured deeper into the woods, the fog thickened and the visibility in a short amount of time decreased significantly. Now I began to feel very nervous. The forest dropped down again in an unusual quiet state, and it seemed so desolate I figured now's a good time to turn around and head back and maybe get some sleep. So I began to slowly retrace my steps, and a strange figure had caught my attention in the distance. It appeared to be a tall, humanoid creature with reptilian features, such as scales covering its skin. It moved slowly, as if purposefully trying not to draw attention to itself. Feeling both horrified and also curious, I cautiously followed it, keeping a safe distance, but only for a very short time. I don't even think more than a couple of moments. Suddenly, this creature stopped facing me directly. Our eyes would lock, and I instantly felt a cold, paralyzing fear wash over my entire body. The being's piercing orange-yellow eyes seemed to be looking right through me. I stood there petrified as this thing slowly tilted its head and emitted a strange sound, 
my instincts kicked in, I turned on my heels, sprinting back towards my campsite. My heart was pounding as I ran, desperately trying to create more distance between me and it. Now, whatever this being was began speaking to me telepathically. Its thoughts invaded my mind, telling me that I needed to leave or face dire consequences. The voice was insistent, threatening that it wouldn't take kindly to intruders. I felt my body seizing up, and running now felt extremely difficult. The feeling was akin to jumping into an ice bath for several minutes, and as I reached the edge of the campsite, the telepathic communication ceased abruptly, and the icy sensation began to subside. What overcame me was a physical and mental numbness. That's the only way I know how to describe it. I left everything I had and ran back to my car where I blacked out and collapsed on the ground. Now, next thing I know, I'm waking up in a hospital room. It's the morning time. My body is aching and my mind is still reeling from the encounter. The doctors informed me that I was found unconscious by a ranger who happened to pass by early in the morning. They ran several tests, but found no explanation for my condition. The doctor who began talking to me was happy to see I was conscious and informed me that they had ran all the usual tests like blood work and whatnot and everything looked relatively normal. I simply told them that I had just fainted and I wasn't sure why. Now, not that much happened between then and the time that I was released later that morning. Now, fast forward to the evening and I began to develop strange and bizarre symptoms. Strange shaped burn marks began appearing on my skin that stung and a throbbing headache would come and go. Over the next few days, these things not only persisted, but grew in intensity and pain. Around day four or five, I began violently vomiting blood and had to go back to the hospital. Unfortunately, they couldn't find anything wrong with me, despite my serious current symptoms. At about the 10-day mark or so after my initial experience, everything just stopped all at once. I spent several weeks agonizing over or whether or not I should share my story fearing ridicule and the possibility of being deemed mentally unstable. However, I couldn't deny that something extraordinary and terrifying had happened to me in the Pisgah National Forest that night. Now, eventually, I would share my encounter with a few trusted friends and begin to research similar occurrences. I discovered that there are actually others who have experienced contact with reptilian beings, not only in the U.S., but all around the world. Now, to this day, I still struggle with understanding the true nature of my experience and the intentions of this being that I encountered. I'm just an ordinary guy. I didn't ask to have this experience. I did not want to have this experience. Initially, when I saw the figure in the fog, I didn't know who or what it was, and I just felt compelled for some reason to follow them or it. The only thing I ask is if you read this story to your audience, just please omit my name. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. In 2009, my family and I went to go stay at these cabins located in the deep woods of Missouri for a week during summer vacation. My parents thought it would be a great idea to unplug and spend some quality time together. Little did we know that this would become the most unforgettable trip. The cabins were owned by a local guy named Jay, but we always joked around and called him Old Man Jenkins. He lived in the area for as long as anyone could remember. These cabins were rustic, a bit run down, but they had a sort of charm about them. I remember, there were three in total, one for my parents, one for my older brother, Jack and me, and another for our cousins and their parents. 
Our cabin was close to a small creek and was surrounded by tall, dense trees that seemed to whisper in the wind. The first couple of days went by without any issues. We spent our time hiking, swimming in the creek, and enjoying time together. It was a lot of fun, but there was always this eerie feeling in the air, like something was wrong. I tried to ignore it, but I couldn't shake it off. Now on the third night, things took a turn for the worse. Jack and I were settling into our bunk beds, talking about the day's adventures, when we heard a faint, chilling howl in the distance. We looked at one another, startled, but figured it was just a wolf or maybe a coyote. We brushed it off, eventually drifting off to sleep. The next day, my cousin Jamie came running over to our cabin, looking pale and scared. He said he'd seen something weird in the woods while he was exploring. He described it as tall, a very shadowy figure with strange eyes, and that it vanished when he shone his light on it. We were all a bit spooked, but our parents brushed it off as a simple trick of the light. That apparently, we had let our imaginations run wild. Now, that night, we decided to get together around the cabin and have a movie night to calm our nerves. Jack had managed to sneak in a portable DVD player with some horror movies despite our parents' no-electronics rule, of course. We all huddled together, watching the movie, eating popcorn, when we heard this loud, aggressive knock. We went to answer it, but when we opened the door, there was no one there. Just a gust of cold wind that sent a shiver down our spines. Feeling uneasy, we just decided to call it a night and head to our separate cabins, Jack and I were lying in our beds, talking about the strange events, when we heard the same chilling howl again. This time, it was closer, and then we heard something. Heavy footsteps outside our cabin, accompanied by labored heavy breathing. It sounded like someone who had been smoking cigarettes their whole life, and had massive lungs. We held our breaths, frozen in fear as the doorknob began to violently move. The door cracked open, and standing in the doorway was the same shadowy figure Jamie had described earlier. Seven feet tall, long gangly limbs. We were too terrified to scream. Whatever it was just seemed to stare at us for what felt like hours before it slowly backed away. The next morning, we tried to tell our parents what had happened, but they didn't believe us. They thought we had been influenced by the horror movies we had watched, but Jack, Jamie, and I knew what we had seen. We were too scared to spend another night in those cabins. We begged our parents to leave, and eventually, they agreed. Now, I know what you might be thinking, that we were just pranked, and that somebody was messing with us. But get this, when my parents went to go talk to Jay, a.k.a. Old Man Jenkins, about this strange figure, he didn't seem surprised. Apparently, even previous tenants reported the same thing. Strange, almost paranormal-like events happening to them. Strange sounds, things that were unexplainable, noises and sights that terrified people. Apparently... Years back, there were even people who practiced witchcraft in these same cabins. Now, I don't know or I don't claim to know how far back that was or what exactly the specifics were on that. That's just the information he shared with us. And I'll never forget it because it was so matter-of-fact, like he was so desensitized to it when we told him what we had experienced. My parents pulled me aside, apologized that they did not believe me, and we decided to leave that day. I'm not going to sit here and claim that this was, in fact, some sort of demonic entity, but I guess I'm surprised looking back at my parents' reaction, considering they were not believers in anything supernatural. I guess what Jay said really got to them. 
My uncle, an ex-police officer, told me this story a few months ago. I've been wanting to post it here ever since. I hope you enjoy it. It was a chilly winter night, and my uncle was on routine patrol in his police car. He'd been a cop for over a decade at this point, and he feels like he'd seen just about everything. But there was something about this night that was just different. He was busy going down a quiet country road, with only the headlights of his car piercing through the darkness. The time was around two in the morning, and he knew that most people in this quiet rural area were all fast asleep. As he continued down the road, he began to notice something strange. There was a dark shape on the side of the road up ahead. It reminded him of an animal, but something was off. Intrigued and curious, he slowed his patrol car to a crawl, shining his spotlight on a mysterious figure. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. The creature, it had the body of a man, but with large, black, leathery wings sprouting from its back. He talked about how its eyes glowed this sinister Hollywood movie red, and it seemed as if it was staring right at him, pouring all of its energy in his direction. My uncle, who was a seasoned officer, was shaken to the core. This is a man who had been in several firefights, someone who had been near death multiple times, but he had never encountered anything like this before. He reached for his radio, intending to report this, but told me he hesitated. What would his colleagues think? He might be laughed, or worse, his sanity questioned. His reputation and career were on the line. After a tense moment, he decided to keep silent. As he slowly drove past this figure that seemed to be almost still, it spread out its wings and let out this otherworldly screech that sent chills down my uncle's spine. He sped away, not daring to look back as this thing took flight into the air. For weeks after that night, my uncle claims he was plagued by nightmares and doubts about what he'd seen. He couldn't shake the image of the red-eyed winged creature from his mind. He began to research similar sightings, desperate to find someone who had experienced something similar. He talked about how he stumbled upon the legend of Mothman, a creature or being said to have terrorized the town of Point Pleasant. Though the description of the creature matched what he'd seen, he couldn't be sure if it was the same entity. Finally, he confided in a fellow officer, who, to his surprise, did not laugh or dismiss his story. Instead, the officer revealed that he, too, had encountered something unexplainable during a night patrol only years earlier. The two officers formed a bond over their shared experiences. My uncle felt a weight lifted off his shoulders. He still faced a dilemma. Should he report the sighting or stay quiet? In the end, he chose to remain quiet, for fear of jeopardizing his career and reputation. He continued to serve for more years before retiring. But the memory of that night never faded. Now that he's retired, he has shared his stories more openly, hoping to find others who've experienced similar things. Although he still struggles with the reality and how this sighting coincides with that, he hopes that by sharing this, he can help others struggling with the same decision.